Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Native Plant Society Southern Piedmont Chapter April Zoom meeting. My name is Beth Davis, and I'm the Southern Piedmont Chapter co-chair along with Lisa Tompkins. We're glad you joined us today on this beautiful spring day. We're so grateful to everyone for, from across the state for joining us um, for the Southern Piedmont chapter. And we're also grateful to the staff at UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden for co-hosting this event with us. Our speaker today is Amy Tipton. And you may or may, if, if you, you may or not know Amy yet, but um, she's very busy this time of year. She's in the middle of, um, assisting the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens with their spring plant sale, but she took out time to also talk to us about pollinators. So we're so happy to have her today. A little bit of background on Amy. She's the assistant director of the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens, as I said, and her master's is in botany with a focus on native plant ID and forest ecology. She's included in her education. She included many classes in aquatic ecology as well. She holds a bachelor's degree in drawing and art history, as well as an MFA in printmaking. She enjoys botanical gardening. And in addition to that, she also enjoys researching and learning about historical female botanists, ecologists, and scientific illustrators. Amy's taught for over 20 years and some of her past teaching posts include drawing, field ecology, excuse me, field ecology and art appreciation at universities literacy in elementary schools and life science to seventh graders. That's a really broad background. Um, she often presents talks for those interested in native plants, native plant societies, natural history societies, regional biology conferences, master gardeners functions. She loves talking about native plants and also the ecology around native plants. And I think that's what we're gonna hear from her today. She's been with the UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden since July of 2018. And during that time, she's taught classes in the Certificate of Native Plant Studies program, Native Tree ID, Native Shrub ID, Botanical Drawing 1 and 2, and Botanical Watercolor. And I encourage you to check out the garden's website uh, for their fall classes She's a, she's a wonderful teacher, and we're very, very pleased to have her talking to us about bees and pollinators. So, so Amy, we look forward to hearing from you today. Well, thank you so much, Beth. I really appreciate the warm welcome, and I enjoy partnering with you every month. Um, I would like to say that my path has been very meandering, <laughs> as you can tell from, from Beth's intro. So. Uh, unlike my husband, who's a classical guitarist, and he has always only done that one thing professionally, I've been all over the place, which has really helped inform my job at the gardens. And uh, I love working at the gardens. I hope that all of you have an opportunity to see the gardens. And if you've been there before, uh, come back. It's different every week. And it's just amazing. I actually did a wildflower hike this morning in the Glen, and it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful day, beautiful time of year. So please come and check out the gardens. We're open um, dawn to dusk. So, but uh, getting on to today's presentation, I will stay, uh, say first off that I am in no way an entomologist. I, I do not study insects. I know a fair amount about them, um, but the only real class I've taken in insect uh, identification was aquatic insects, which are quite a bit different than many of our pollinate, pollinators. Um, so I know more about dragonflies and water bugs and <laughs> things like that in some ways, but anyway. Um, so I wanted to kind of expand the title of the talk. It's not just about what bees see, but it's what bees and other pollinators see and smell and taste and feel. Um, our pollinators have many things that they're looking for in a plant. And so we're gonna talk about some of those and um, how the plants and animals are adapted to one another over many years, many, many years of evolution in order to partner with each other to create a, um, beneficial pollination um, 
symbiosis. So before I get into that, I, I wanted to just very quickly talk a little bit about flower structure. And this is important because um, we have sterile parts of the flower, which is what most of us think of as a flower, the petals particularly. Um, also the sepals are sterile parts. Uh, there might be glands within the flower that are sterile. And by sterile, I mean they don't have any direct function with the process of getting the pollen to the egg to uh, fertilize and create a seed and a fruit. So the sterile parts are important in other ways, but they don't really actively participate in the, um, in the mechanism to get the pollen where it needs to go. Whereas the um, fertile parts include the pistil, which is the, all of the female parts together, the sticky stigma at the end, um, the end of the structure, the style, which is kind of the stalk of the female structure, and then the ovary. All of that together is the pistil or sometimes called the carpal. Um, that is absolutely necessary for sexual reproduction, as are the stamens, which are the male portions, uh, which include this filament, this long uh, structure, and then the anther, which is where the pollen is, is born. And then the pollen would need to go from the anther to a stigma in order to pollinate the plant. So when we have uh, flowers, the, the reason we have flowers is specifically for reproduction. Um, flowers have that one purpose. It's for reproducing to create fruit of some sort, either a fleshy fruit like we're familiar with eating or something dry like a capsule that has seeds in it. Um, that's the whole purpose of the flower. It doesn't have any other purpose. And plants are, um, are really bent on creating these flowers to have future generations of their genetic material. And if you've ever seen a plant that is really stressed, maybe it's not getting enough water, or maybe it's not getting enough light, or it's just not being well taken care of, oftentimes that flower or that plant will flower abundantly because it's thinking, oh no, I'm going to die. I haven't fulfilled my life's purpose. So I need to flower so that I can uh, continue my, my genetic makeup in my offspring. Um, so here again, you see the images, not a diagram, but photographs of fertile versus mm -hmm. sterile structures. Okay. So in the image here on the left, you see this is golden seal, golden seal, and it has these uh, male parts around, many, many male parts. These um, anthers will produce the pollen. And then in the center are many carpels together. And that is essentially the entirety of that flower. It does not have showy petals. It does not have showy sepals. The only showy part about this flower is the multitude of white stamens, which um, from a distance almost look like little strappy petals. And then compare that to this image on the right of a hydrangea. So hydrangeas have two different types of flowers. They have sterile flowers and fertile flowers. And so this is a sterile flower. It doesn't have any of the reproductive parts. It only has these large bracts um, that look like petals, um, but it has these large bracts to attract pollinators, to be showy, to say, hey, I'm over here. I need to be pollinated. But these flowers are not the ones that are pollinated because they don't have male or female structures. These little flowers on the hydrangea are the fertile flowers and they have reproductive structures. So although the, the sterile parts attract some pollinators, the pollinators actually find what they're looking for, where, whether it be nectar or pollen in the smaller fertile flowers that aren't so showy. 
So there are two methods of pollination. One is cross-pollination and the other is self-pollination. Cross-pollination is when we have a flower that, uh, or multiple flowers, which one provides the pollen and one provides the egg. Uh, and the pollen goes from one flower to another. That might be uh, well, cross-pollination. Typically, we're talking about from a flower on one plant to a flower on another plant so that we have some genetic differences. You're crossing, so the offspring are going to have some traits of the male and some traits of the female to uh, increase the genetic diversity so that populations can be very robust and not um, influenced by disease or any other type of environmental stresses as much as if you just had one genetically similar population of plants. So um, that's cross-pollination. And then self-pollination is when a plant actually, uh, the pollen from one flower goes to the stigma or the female receiving portion of the same flower. And um, this is often discouraged in the evolution of plants. Um, in fact, there are many ways in which plants have adapted ways so that they won't self-pollinate because that does create this monotony of genet uh, genetic um, diversity or lack of genetic diversity. However, there are some plants that actively use self-pollination. So let's talk about some of those. Um, some plants that prevent uh, self-pollination are examples like this one. So these are uh, spice bush flowers. They're very, very small. On the left is the female spice bush flower. So a spice bush, the entire individual will either be a male plant or a female plant. And both will have flowers, but the female plant will have flowers that look like the image on the left and the male plant will look like the image on the right, all of the flowers. So here we see the petals. We see the female structure, the pistil or carpal with the stigma at the end. And here we see the petals and the anthers with the pollen bearing structures. And here you see a little bit of pollen on the end of that anther. So you might ask, well, what are these structures? They look sort of like anthers. They look sort of like stigmas. What are those things? Those are actually uh, nectar glands. So nectar glands in the spice bush are pretty pronounced and uh, they produce nectar to attract some of the pollinators at that time of year. Um, but because you have one plant with all female flowers and one plant with all male flowers, there's no chance of self-pollination. There has to be some genetic intermixing. Another way in which plants will prevent self-pollination is to have different times at which the male and female parts mature. So this is a wild geranium, geranium maculatum, and uh, here you see the anthers are ripe, the, especially these with the yellow, more of a yellow tone. They are ripe with pollen. However, the end of the pistil or the end of the carpal is tight, um, tightly closed together. It, it is not receptive to pollen right now. So the geranium will shed the pollen during the male phase and later, after all of the anthers uh, fall off, after they've done their job and that pollen has gone to other flowers, then this plant will open its stigma. It's got five parted, very sticky stigma. It'll open its stigma and then it can receive pollen from other plants that are in the male phase. And you see that again here in the um, Silene or um, Indian pink, no, wait, is it Royal Catchfly? Um, this plant also has a male phase with the anthers and the pollen. 
and a female phase where the anthers are, are more or less shriveled up or gone, and then the stigmas are exposed to receive pollen. Now, there are some plants, as I mentioned before, that can cross pollinate with the aid of animals, or they can self pollinate. And this is a, a mechanism that is often found in our early spring flowers. Um, these two images are of bloodroot. Bloodroot is one of our earliest spring bloomers. And at the time that bloodroot emerges and flowers, there aren't a lot of pollinators that are out and about. And so it's kind of taking a chance if it were only to depend on cross-pollination. It would be taking a, ch a chance as to whether or not the flower would be pollinated. Um, when the flowers do receive pollinators, the pollinators go to town because there aren't a lot of really early bloomers. But it's hit and miss depending on the daytime temperatures and how much the, the animals have warmed up and started being active. So a secondary mechanism for this plant is to self-pollinate. So it, the male and the female portions of the flower are mature at the same time, and it is possible for it to self-pollinate. And that is just kind of a safeguard in case there aren't pollinators so that it will make fruit and seed. But it would be more beneficial if um, there were pollinators for cross-pollination. Okay, another early spring flower is um, our violets. We have several species of violets. Um, this is Vi Viola sororia, or common blue violet. This is the one that you pull up from your gardens by the handfuls. And if you've ever looked closely, you might see structures that look like these pale, um, swollen structures near the surface of the soil. Um, so in the spring, the, wild, the violets create a flower that's colorful, that's open and receptive to pollinators. And um, hopefully that will work. Hopefully the pollinators are, will be out and about and successfully will pollinate those flowers. However, as a fail safe, just like the blood root, um, the violet has a different mechanism, but this is even more specialized than bloodroot. The self-pollination occurs in these special types of flowers. So these are flowers turning into fruits called cleistogamous flowers. Kleist is like um, closed, like cloister. Um, so the flowers never develop into an open structure. They're, they remain closed, but the female and male parts are in each of these closed flowers. And so the plant pollinates itself within those closed flowers. And as um, this typically happens later in the season during the summer, and then uh, when you dig them up or when you look underneath, you will see these large relative to the violet, you'll see these large fruiting structures that open after they have matured into a three-part structure with lots of golden brown seeds in there. And that is the clostogamous flowers that have turned into fruits. So when we consider uh, cross-pollination, we need to think a little bit about efficiency. So there are a couple different main ways to cross pollinate. One is through abiotic means, abiotic meaning without the, the involvement of life out, outside of the individual plant or biotic, depending on animals typically in order to move the pollen. So, um, in the image here, I believe this is an eastern red cedar, which obviously does not have um, flowers per se, but it does, it does produce pollen and it produces a lot of pollen. So when the, the plant is investing in its 
um, what it's sexual reproduction, it's investing most of its energy into making lots and lots and lots of pollen. And the reason for this is because this tree is wind pollinated. It does not depend on animals. It does not need to attract animals. It just needs to get the pollen out there and aloft and to the next tree over. Um, so that's where all of that energy goes to is the pollen for the most part. That is different when you're looking at a plant that is dependent on animals. So not all animal dependent plants have very, very showy flowers, but they have typically something to offer the pollinator, whether it is nectar or um, other types of food, pollen, um, it might have an attractant of, of a scent. Um, so we'll talk about some of those different things, but when you're a plant, you're investing a lot of energy into reproduction, but the mechanisms for the, that is different depending on whether you're pollinated by wind or water, abiotic, or you're pollinated by insects, birds, bats, things like that. So when you see a flower where the petals and the sepals and the nectar glands are very, very small or they're absent, that is a good indication that that plant is pollinated by the wind or water. Water's not very, water pollination isn't very common, um, but there are instances of that in our flora. Um, so we're talking about all of the sterile parts of the flower are minimized. So all the energy is going into the fertile parts, the pollen and to a lesser extent, the female portions. So here are a few examples of that. Uh, we have, this is a white oak. So we have white oak flowers, they're in clusters. And each of the flowers has, is a little globule. And each of the globules have many, many stamen. And each of the stamen produce copious amounts of pollen, as you see here. And then uh, in this image, you see there are no petals per se, no sepals per se, but these are the anthers. The anthers, actually, I'm sorry. I think this is, this one is white oak and this is actually an alder in the middle, but they have a similar drooping uh, grouping of flowers that can be swayed in the wind to release the pollen. So those are the male flowers of those two species. And here are the female flowers. On the left, this is the female flower of white oak. It's very, very small. This is what becomes the acorn. And this is a flower of the alder. And in both of these images, what you're seeing protruding from this flower is the stigma or the sticky female part ready to receive that pollen. And here we have two stigmas per flower. And in the oak, we have three stigmas per flower or, or branches of the stigmas. And then in rare cases, there is water pollination where pollen grains are formed um, in flowers that are submerged in the water. And the pollen will be swept in the water current from plant to plant. So there's really no reason for any of these abiotically pollinated plants to be showy. Um, there's no reason for them to be, to smell good or to have rewards because they are just simply at the whim of the uh, water or the wind. So getting to what you were expecting to hear today, we're gonna talk about biotic uh, cross-pollination. And this is when the sterile parts of the flower are significant. And that might be the petals are really showy or the sepals are really fleshy, or there are glands that are producing oils or uh, nectar, um, and or in some cases uh, resin, 
in order to attract um, either invertebrates like insect um, pollinators or birds, or in some areas of the world, we have mammal pollinators as well, but not in, not in North Carolina. So there are also other parts of the world, particularly tropical areas that depend on other species of birds other than hummingbirds for pollination, such as uh, in Hawaii, there are honey creepers. Um, there are many, many different examples, but here we have the hummingbirds in addition to the insects. Okay, so what are bee seas? Um, you might be surprised to find out that you know, we all know that bees have compound eyes, but in addition to the two eyes on either side of their head that are compound, they have three small eyes on the top of their head. And the compound eyes create um, small pixelated bits of visual information that the bee can put together in its mind. So. People have the misconception that a compound eye is you're seeing all of an image like we would see many, many times, but that's not quite how it works. It's more like a pixelated image. So each one of those uh, little parts of the eye will actually capture part of the image in a pixel. And then the eyes on the top of the head are more about detecting um, light and dark. And bees are very perceptive of movement. In fact, they are able to process visual movement much, much, that is much, much faster than what humans can. And another difference between honey or bee sight, honeybees are only one kind that we'll talk about, and human sight is that bees can see ultraviolet light. So there's a portion of the spectrum that is not visible to us that is visible to bees. And when, um, when you look at certain native plants and non-native plants under a UV light, you get a chance to see somewhat what a bee would see. And so one of the ways that plants change their UV color, if you will, is by creating a bullseye pattern to pull in the bee to the center where the pollen is so that they'll harvest the pollen and carry it to the next flower. To our eyes, we don't see any shift because we can't see that UV change in color, but the bees can. And here's another example of that bullseye of a similar plant. Uh, UV light will also enable the, or UV spectrum um, detection by bee eyes will show these um, particular types of patterns called nectar guides, sometimes called honey guides. Um, so here we have an evening primrose. To us, it just looks like a nice uh, buttery yellow. And when you put it under UV light, you see that the bee is able to see these um, veins within the flower, which point inward into the nectar area and the pollen area. So it's directing the bee in to the good stuff to make sure that the flower is pollinated. And um, I did want to mention that Bees can also see all visible color. So it's not as if they only see this image on the right or only see the image on the left. They see um, a range of, or a kind of a combination of those images. And then um, bee pollinated flowers also often will have a landing petal where the bee can kind of support itself and rest so it won't have to fly while it's trying to harvest the pollen or the nectar. And you see guides on this ultraviolet image of the violet on the right. 
So little guides leading them in. And then on the left, um, this is a dwarf crested iris. Iris have these yellow signal patches, which don't, they're not a fertile part. They're not pollen bearing or anything like that. It's just a modulation in color that um, tempts the bees into that portion of the plant. So we talked a little bit about what bees see. And in general, bees prefer flower colors that are white, yellow, or blue, or have some uh, UV components of the striations or the bullseye. Um, but bees also have taste and they taste through their mouth parts. Um, so here's a diagram of the bee's mouth parts. And the most important one to note is the proboscis. Uh, the proboscis is what will actually be inserted into the flower to um, get at any nectar that might be available. And here you see the entirety of the, um, the mouth parts going in. And then this is a as you can see, this is kind of a hard structure, but inside the, um, the hard structure is the proboscis, uh, which is kind of like a, a tongue-like appendage. And bees can have, depending on the genus or the species of bee, they can have a wide range of different lengths of um, these mouth parts. And this helps them adapt to certain types of flowers. So, you can't necessarily just look at a flower and say, oh, I know that that is pollinated only exclusively by a bee. It might be able to be pollinated by many different types of insects, or it might be um, highly specialized to only a very long snouted bee, for example. And then bees also can smell. And plants take advantage of this by creating not only uh, the nectar from the nectar glands, but uh, for the taste, but for the smell, bees will have um, scent glands. And the scent glands are picked up, um, the odor is picked up by the bees as well. And uh, plants that bees like to visit typically have a relatively light, fresh scent. And um, so they, within the honeybee antenna, that's where their olfactory or scent uh, receptors are all along the, the segmented antenna. So that's how they smell. And that's what brings them to uh, sweet smelling spring flowers, for example. And then, uh, bees will also come to flowers specifically for a substance that's called floral oils. Um, floral oils are different than nectar and they're different than the scent glands. The oils are high fatty uh, substance and they, um, they provide certain, uh, a lot of energy uh, for the bee, for its uh, metabolism. And typically these floral oils are uh, created by these glands called aliophores. And they are common on such plants as um, iris and uh, members of the figwort family, the scroffs, and also some of the orchids. And then um, talking a little bit more about the nectar glands. Nectar can be easily accessible in some plants and it can be very deeply buried in some flowers. So um, flowers that are long and tubular with nectar at the base of the flower require a particular type of animal or group of animals that have long proboscis to get into the plant and reach that nectar. But then there are other flowers that the nectar is fairly close to the surface of the flower and those, that nectar can be harvested and the pollen can be collected on the hairs of the bees um, 
that have shorter snouts or other insects that have shorter snouts. So um, before I start talking about the different types of bees, I did want to mention that in addition to the nectar, which is high in carbohydrates, the oils, which are typically not on the same types of flowers or species of flowers as nectar. If a plant has floral oils, it typically won't have nectar, uh, nectar glands. But some of the ways that attract different insects are the nectar, the oils, uh, the scent, and also pollen. So oils are oily, nectar is carb rich, and pollen is high in protein. Pollen can have up to 71% of its mass um, in protein. And it ranges depending on the species of flower, but that's a really important sor source for insects, especially for brooding or um, managing young. And um, bees have special types of stomachs that have digestive enzymes that can break down pollen in ways that a lot of animals cannot, a lot, a lot of other insects cannot. Um, and that is called their honey gut. Um, and let's see. Yeah, and another thing about the, the bees is that bees are covered with hairs. So as we go through the different types of bees, you'll see there are hairs on their eyes, there are hairs on their legs, um, on their bodies, abdomens, everywhere practically. Um, bees are very, very furry. And this helps the pollen stick to them. The pollen of these types of plants that attract bees, the pollen is also very sticky. Um, unlike wind, poll wind pollinated plants, that pollen is very dry and light, uh, whereas the pollen of the insect pollinated plants, the pollen is larger grained and it's sticky. So it'll stick to the hairs and structures called combs on the, on the bees or other insects and then travel to the next flower. Okay, so uh, one group of bees, I'm not gonna talk about all groups because we have many, many different groups of bees and a multitude of species of bees in North Carolina, but sweat bees are actually a very important pollinator. Um, we have lots of different species of sweat bees, but on the left, you see a green metallic sweat bee. Um, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, you'll see them oftentimes pollinating, uh, especially in the, in the summertime. And then, um, so that's on a cone flower. And then on the right, you see a sweat bee pollinating a um, yellow star, uh, hypoxis flower. Here we see um, another uh, cone flower plant. So it's covered in bees and bees have, see all those hairs around the bodies of the bees. Um, bees also have pollen saddles on their legs where they can pack pollen to carry around in, in a really efficient way. And in this uh, echinacea, you see that the, um, the inner flowers have not opened yet, but these outer flowers have opened and there's pollen there. So throughout the life of the gone flower, the pollen will arise in rings from the outer portion of the flower to the inner portion of the flower as it matures. There are also some bees that take advantage of nectar without actually pollinating. And uh, some people refer to these as banded bees. So they have these uh, sharp mouth parts that can puncture the, uh, the petal tube of a flower and they just go right into the nectar glands, get what they want and fly away without getting anywhere close to the pollen. Um, there are also mining bees. Um, and you can see how furry this one is, just completely covered in pollen. And then uh, honeybees. 
So we have many species of native honeybees. Unfortunately, they're in decline, but they're still a very important pollinator. And um, you can see the pollen saddles or pollen basket here on its legs, uh, hairs throughout its body that trap and collect the pollen. And here you see one that has its basket full visiting a goldenrod. Um, Honeybees also are very important for certain fruit crops, um, although this is not native plants. Um, our almonds, cherries, which we do have, we have native cherries, but almonds, cherries, peaches, things like that are dependent on honeybees. And uh, we have several sister species, if you will, of that group, including like our wild plums, our wild cherries, our crab apples, our hawthorns. Um, those are also pollinated by honeybees. And honeybees also like onion flowers, which is what you're seeing here on the right. Now getting to the big guys, uh, we have bumblebees. And bumblebees are um, particularly they particularly favor flowers that have landing pads and are highly uh, decorated with stripes or spots. Um, and it's really fun to watch bumblebees pollinate because they're just so heavy and they'll, they'll light on a flower and, and the flower will tip to the ground with their weight. But that is advantageous in some ways, the strength and the size of the honeybees for such things as um, certain flowers that are dependent upon what we call buzz pollination. So um, the flower here on the right is a blueberry and it requires buzz pollination by bumblebees. Other insects aren't strong enough to create the vibrations with its wings that are required. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that process uh, later on. And then um, moving away from the bees, we have social wasps and solitary wasps. They're important pollinators as well. Once again, you see a, a wasp on goldenrod. Here's a solitary wasp, uh, which tends to favor phacelia and uh, some other plants as well. And then um, we also have butterflies. So butterflies, you know, as I mentioned, bees tend to be generalists for the most part. They will visit lots and lots of different types of flowers. It's not just one species of bee to one species of plant typically. Um, the same is true with many of our butterflies when it comes to finding nectar sources. So butterflies are very dependent on nectar and that high sugar content in order to live as, an, as adults and be able to create um, their offspring. That nectar is what they're wanting and they will get nectar from all kinds of different plants. However, once they're ready to lay their eggs, they have a special association with particular plants typically, which serve as host plants for their caterpillars. So they're generalists when it comes to pollination, but specialists when it comes to uh, food for their young. And so uh, we have a swallowtail with lyre-leaved sage on the left, and a monarch butterfly here um, might be nectaring. It looks like its proboscis might be going into a flower. But more likely, it is in the process of uh, mating and or getting ready to mate and or laying eggs on the milkweed because the milkweed can serve as both a nectar source and a host plant for its young. So the um, monarch will lay its eggs on the leaves of the plant and the, hex, the eggs will hatch into small caterpillars and the caterpillars will quickly defoliate the milkweed um, taking the, the toxins that are in milkweed into their bodies. It doesn't hurt the monarchs, but it makes them less tasty and actually poisonous to a lot of predators, 
which helps the butterfly. Okay, uh, on the left we have a dog bane, um, a dog bane flower, and on the right we have a milkweed. So this is a, a good example of monarchs aren't the only pollinators of milkweed. There are lots of pollinators of milkweed, um, but the milkweed is a specialized host to monarchs. And then um, swallowtails, a couple different species of swallowtails nectaring. Um, but then when they're ready to lay their eggs, the different species of swallowtails have different species of host plants. There's a spice bush swallowtail that utilizes spice bush for uh, laying eggs. There's a um, pipe vine swallowtail, which uses the Dutchman's pipe vine for laying its eggs. Um, there are some butterflies that are specialized for sassafras uh, food sources and many, many other different types of plants. Okay, we're still in the same group of insects. So this is the lep Lepidoptera, but uh, we're moving to moths now. So when we think of a moth, typically we think of um, a white or dull um, night flying insect. And that is the case with many of them, but there are a couple different groups of moths that are daytime, are active during the daytime. And those include the uh, clear wing uh, hummingbird moth here that you see pollinating some bee balm, I believe. And then on the right, we have a sphinx moth. Um, also hawk moths are, are like this and they will pollinate during the day as well. Um, and then we have what you typically think of as moths that um, are specially adapted to come out at night to nectar and pollinate uh, night blooming flowers or flowers which release a heavy sweet scent in the nighttime. Um, so this is the yucca moth and uh, yucca flowers. This is yucca filamentosa, one of our native um, more succulent kind of plants. Um, with the night flowering plants, they tend to be white. They're a bright white. And um, if you've ever had moonflower, it's a giant, not a native, but it's a giant morning glory type plant. It only blooms at night and the bright stark whiteness of that bloom will attract pollinators, moth pollinators, um, particularly if the moon is out and um, there's a full moon, it'll be very bright. And then there are other ones that um, can utilize a moth. Uh, so here's a mayapple. So we have a little moth on there. And then honestly, I don't know what this insect is. I have a feeling that it's a moth, but I'm not really certain. But it's interesting and it's on a, uh, a milkweed. I wanted to share that with you as well. Okay, and then moving on to a different class of pollinators. We have fly pollinated plants. So plants typically have uh, a couple different mechanisms for attracting flies. One is that they will emit a really stinky odor um, that's like rotten flesh in order to attract the flies. Um, they might also have a really fleshy kind of uh, flower that the, the flies can eat eat, uh, more so beetles, but sometimes flies. And um, even though these guys look sort of like bees, these are hoverflies. And um, we have some very important pollinators like um, these on the trillium that are very, very small flies, but they're really important for pollination. And this is the stinking Benjamin, uh, trillium erectum. Um, it has a very, that very strong fetid odor that attracts the flies. Then a couple more images of hoverflies. Um, grass of Parnassus is the white flower. 
And then I don't believe this is a native flower, but it's in the pink family, um, in the carnation family with a hoverfly on it on the right. And uh, then there's some plants that attract both flies and beetles, or possibly just beetles. They tend, uh, the beetle pollinated plants tend to have flowers close to the ground because beetles are, tend to crawl. They can fly, but they tend to crawl. And they have a really strong um, rotten odor that attracts these beetles, particularly carrion beetles. Um, and so the animals are just able to crawl right into the flower or chew through the flower uh, in order to get to, to the inside of the flower. And the flowers have um, another mechanism that is really interesting with in the arum family, like these skunk cabbages and also um, our Titan arum at the university, if you're familiar with that, it's not native, but it has a similar mechanism, which is called thermogenesis. So when the female portions of the, of the inner plant are active and ready to receive pollen, the plant puts a lot of energy into heating up the core of the, of the female flowers in order to attract these beetles and flies into that area. And then sometimes, the, uh, depending on the species, they might trap the flies or the beetles there um, until they have had ample time to pollinate. And um, then there are other types of beetles which are not necessarily ground dwelling. They're, they're more of flyers, um, including um, we have longhorn beetles, which I don't think this is an example of a longhorn, but longhorn beetles can pollinate, several other species of, of beetles can pollinate plants. Um, and then getting to bird vision. So specifically talking about hummingbirds, um, they can see what we can see, but they can also see, um, they can also see ultraviolet light like the, the bees can. And so when we're looking at hummingbird flowers, um, Hummingbirds like the tubular red flowers, cardinal flower on the right. Um, and then we've got the trumpet creeper and also the, the Lanicera sempervirens or the native honeysuckle vine. Uh, columbine with the nectar in the nectar glands in the very tippy tip of the spur of the petals. And now back to buzz pollination. So in a lot of the anthers or male uh, pollen producing parts, the entire anther will split down the middle and curl open side to side to expose the pollen. Like if you think about when you buy lilies at the store, um, sometimes you'll buy lilies that'll be closed and the anthers will be shut but then as the flowers open, those anthers split uh, long ways and they curl to open the orange pollen. Certain flowers don't have that type of uh, uh, suture. They have a little hole at the end of the anther and it requires a particular type of pollination. So if you flip this anther upside down, you have this structure here. This is shooting star. Um, the decadent media has the anthers together and then you have the stigma exerted beyond the anthers and only at the very end is the pollen able to escape, but it doesn't readily do so on its own. It requires a bumblebee. So a bumblebee will light onto the flower and then it will, um, it will vibrate its, its wings and that vibration will cause the pollen to separate from the inner walls of the anther and come down and be deposited on the bee's belly. And when it goes to the next one, you can imagine that pollen uh, goes right to the next stigma. 
Another uh, type of plant that does this with bumblebees is uh, the vaccinium or the blueberries. And the anthers are particularly interesting in this plant. We have anthers that are two parted. So they have two horns with the openings at the end of each horn. And once again, the bees have to get in there, uh, vibrate their wings in order to get the pollen to release. Um, there was something else I was going to tell you about this. What was it? Oh, yes, I saw a video while I was putting this together, a video of someone who used a tuning fork. So a tuning fork is a metal uh, two, two barred um, metal thing. You, you hit it against a soft surface and it vibrates to create a pitch that you can tune an instrument to. Um, but the person used a tuning fork and the vibrations from the tuning fork when uh, held close to some of these plants did the same, had the same effect as the bumblebees as releasing pollen. And then, as I mentioned before, some of the arums have um, trapping mechanisms. So here you see, uh, I believe this is a type of wasp. I can't remember, maybe not, um, but the insects come into the flower and they're trapped there. Um, these are insects that are already harboring pollen. They're trapped and um, they're forced to just buzz around and get their pollen all over these stigmas, the female parts, the sticky stigmas. And then unfortunately in this species of plant, the insects die. They never do get a chance to emerge. And then I wanted to show you a little bit more, as I mentioned about the sterile and fertile flowers of hydrangea. Hydrangea is not the only plant that does this. Um, pretty sure that species of dogwood and also viburnum will do this. Um, and as I mentioned, the sterile flowers are what help bring the bumblebees in but then the bumblebees are only really interested in the nectar once they get there and the pollen. So that was a whirlwind course in some of our animal pollination, um, but I think we're about at the end of our time. So at this time, I will take questions. Um, Beth, do you have questions for me? Yes. Yes, yes, that was amazing. Oh. Thank you. That was just really, really interesting. So a couple of questions. Um, do butterflies see UV light like bees or is it just bees? Um, that's a good question. And um, they, I think they do because they do tend to nectar um, with nectar guides, flowers with nectar guides. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are gnats considered flies? I don't think they are. But gnats, um, I have seen gnats on trillium, I believe. So maybe they are a sub, a sub like I said, I'm not an entomologist. <laughs> but there are lots of technically. Tiny... Go ahead. Technically, uh, fruit flies are, or, or, yes, they are considered flies. They're in the same group as flies. Oh, okay, thank you. Fruit flies, gnats, mosquitoes, those are actually all types of flies. And what about thrips? Thrips are also flies. Yep. Okay. And midges. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So all Absolutely. those little tiny noceums are flies. Yes, they're all annoying little flies. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and Amy, when you were doing your research on um, honeybees and your uh, you talked a lot about the honeybees gathering the, the pollen and taking it back to the, I think we understand that a hot European honeybees have a hive and you talked about native honeybees. Do they also live in colonies? Do you know? I'll defer to Carrie for that. <laughs> <laughs> if she's still with us. Um, you know, I'm not certain. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be something for our next program. Sorry, I zoned out there for a minute. Which kind of bees? Honeybees. Honey, uh, native honeybees. 
Um, we do not have native honeybees. So all of the honeybees are European. We have naturalized honeybees, but those are basically just like feral honeybees. They're just kind of out living their own life, like feral pigs or feral dogs or feral horses, but um, they are not native to uh, the Americas. I misspoke then. I There are many, many species of native bees, but not honeybees. Yes, we've got, exactly. We've got sweat bees, mining bees. We've got bumblebees, carpenter bees. Yeah, there are tons of different kinds of native bees. But yeah, the honeybee in particular, the one um, that that you can harvest honey from, that uh, they are the most colonial bee that we have here in the U.S., but it's not native to here. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that, that's good clarification. And speaking of clarification, back in the very beginning when you were talking about self-pollination and you talked about a male and a female plant, but if, if, a, if there's many flowers on one plant and a, a pollinator visits a flower at the top of the plant and takes the pollen to the bottom of the plant. Is that self-pollination or cross-pollination? Um, I think in the strictest use of the word, that would be a selfing, but it's the plant is selfing, the flowers aren't selfing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it just seemed to, um, anyway, it, it confused the humans that were attending the talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the bees, I'm sure the bees knows what know what they're doing. Um, there's a question, what is the distance a bee can smell nectar and pollen, do you think? Wow. Um, I did not even really mention, I don't think that pollen does have an odor, which does attract, um, attract certain insects. Um, but I don't know about distance. Carrie, can you find in? I've got no, <laughs> no information on that. <laughs> uh, I think the the maximum distance that a typical bee will fly like during a day's foraging is really only something like a hundred meters. Mm. Um, so, but I don't really know anything about how well they can sense that stuff. These well, are really good questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was, we're, you're getting lots and lots of um, accolades in the, chat um amy for this oh, very you. informative and just just fascinating talk about mostly flowers and and um a little bit on the insects that that really piqued our interest so um thank you thank you for your time putting this together and sharing it with us today and as, as amy said when she started the, the botanical gardens and of course all the trails around us are just beautiful right now and we encourage everyone to um, take advantage of both the gardens and the mini trails and um, I do want to mention that if you're also um, while you're thinking about pollinators but if you're also planning your home garden the UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden still has copies of uh, two books that you can order uh, by Dr. Melichamp the native, Southeast Native Plant Primer will put the links to where you can order those books and they can be mailed to you from the Botanical Garden. And then the latest book, Native Plants of the Southeast, um, I'm sorry, that was the first book by Dr. Melichamp. And then the Na Southeast Native Plant Primer is the book that was written together with uh, Paula Gross and Larry Melichamp. And both of those have photos from Will Stewart. And it occurred to me while I was watching your, the this very informative um, talk on bees that if this piqued your interest and you missed Will Stewart's talk on butterflies back, I think it may have been September, that is on our YouTube channel. So if you found this fascinating, I encourage you to go back and, and check Will Stewart's talk about butterflies um, and the many, many different species of butterflies that he featured for us. So Amy, thank you. And um, thank you to Craig Maxwell, who is our video editor and who prepares this before we set it up on YouTube. And thank you all for joining us today. We, I'm so glad we were able to gather together virtually. Um, and we, we certainly hope that uh, we can soon be together in person.